Everything we have down here on the walls, so this one, this one, and the two behind you, um, were created in 2016. So that was roughly when I began Messenger Creation, and that's roughly where I, I knew that I liked working on the Perspex. I continued the anxiety sort of mental health monster imagery that I'd been doing at uni. Uh, so it's pretty much, it follows the same sort of style, the same sort of creation, except Patricia, which is this A1 piece, is actually done in a completely different way. So Patricia, unlike these ones, on the reverse side of the Perspex sheet has been spray painted first. So you lose the opaque quality in some of the areas and you keep that solid color in others. Whereas some of the older ones um, are much more opaque because they are just straight onto Perspex. So as, as kind of time has gone on, I've actually changed how I approach the paintings and I've changed how I do it. So now sort of the deeper sort of areas uh, are actually built up out of sort of multiple layers and I see where the color changes happen and I darken sort of like the areas with usually um, fine liners. But that's how I kind of go about the difference between the two because I think sometimes they stand out quite differently. Essentially, the way I work with my paintings, pick two colors. Those two colors go onto the Perspex. I have no idea what the shape is I'm gonna be creating when I start. I literally pick two colors, off we go. Build up a shape, we let it dry partially. Then we return to it with acrylic inks. After we've, so previously we used drawing inks, let the drawing inks dry to an extent, then return with the acrylic inks, which is why you get the kind of the mixture in color and the mixture in kind of the more sort of solid, almost brighter tones. So acrylic inks kind of hold the color completely different to drawing inks, um, but they're a lot more expensive. Um, with with um, Patricia, she basically was using the same set, but instead of building the shape with the ink, I used, I built a shape out of spray paint first. So basically the, the spray paint holds the color to a lot stronger. So this is what I always wanted to be creating in terms of color. When I created these, this is what I had in mind, but it was creating that has been a lot of trial and error. So I think the best example to move on to, this is a piece that was originally created at uni. So during uni, my, I think third year, my mental health was bad. I wasn't getting into uni at all. And I had set out, we had 12 weeks to create enough work that the tutors would deem worthy of 12 weeks work. And I created eight of these. All of them are on acetate about a millimeter thick. So the material itself is incredibly flimsy, but again, it's opaque like the Perspex sheets. So I basically created a series of eight monsters and these eight monsters were a way of me conveying how I portrayed my day-to-day -day life, how I portrayed various situations and if I found it scary. And I think using monsters in, as an imagery was always something favorable for me because it was kind of reverting things back to a very sort of childlike state. Because I find when you, when you consider fear, especially when it's fear of something very irrational, it almost reminds me of when I was a child and when you'd be scared of something that you didn't understand. And I think monster, monsters as an imagery was not only something that I, I as a person was drawn to out of interest because I like, I think the thing I like about monsters is they, a lot of the time they, you know, they don't exist and they're based off things that we've seen that are scary. When you look at things like the anglerfish, that creature is terrifying. And that is, it's that kind of fear of something that is bizarre and different and I always considered my anxiety and my depression as not necessarily a part of me but something scary and different and I think that's why I started playing mostly with the monsters as an imagery and why I've stuck with it for so long because it, it perfectly sort of
takes things that I'm interested in while also sort of relating back to why I started painting them in the first place. So Matilda, I'll get to why I named them in a minute. Matilda was actually created at uni, as I said, which all of this part here is from uni. But this part here, the more brighter part, was actually redone about four months ago. And I returned to Matilda as a painting because I hated this one at uni. The, out of all the eight that I created, this was the one I, de I despised it. And it lived in my studio space, just in the background, for about two years before I re returned to it. And I think returning to it and being able to work into it with my newer technique and be able to kind of create the colours that I was obviously trying to go for back then, I think I created something that was very different and unlike a lot of the other work that I have. And, okay, let's go towards women naming them. So, I think a lot of the time when you're working with something that's quite unpleasant, especially with remembering mental health. Um, I had a piece called Timothy, same size as this. And he was around... Ooh, I think I'd been out of uni for about six months. I'd been trying to get work. I'd managed to get work. And I was bullied in that work. The work itself was just, it was just not for me. And I remember quitting and I felt like I had failed myself rather than I had, you know, I'd been failed because I was treated differently or I just felt that I'd messed up the whole situation. And I was creating Timothy in my parents' garage as I had with all my other pieces. And... I remember of an evening time I would try and sleep and I would have panic attacks. And I think having a panic attack at 11 o'clock at night is one of the most unpleasant things I've ever experienced in my life. Your body is literally telling you to run. Your body is telling you you are in danger, you are unsafe, you need to, uh, you, you, you know, you need to literally protect yourself. And this is, this is for me, sleep and that downtime is very sort of precious to me. And it was very, it was like the first time that my mental health had been that invasive that it just prevented me from even being able to settle up an evening. And when it's something so sort of, when you're covering something in a painting that is very sort of to heart like that, it can hold a power over you. But you spend, I spend so much time with these paintings, I spend so much time working on them, they end up with their own little personalities. They become a separate entity to the time that they were painted and the time they were discussing. So Timothy was born out of those particular emotions and those particular times. But when I look back on Timothy, I see him as Timothy. I don't see him as the time that he was created around. I don't remember. It it's becomes a separate entity. And I, I think of certain paintings more fondly than others. Some of them have basically had accidents where a colour has bled into another or something <coughs> has not gone how I wanted it to go. And... I kind of remember them less fondly as others. They all end up with little weird personalities and it's like, oh, or if it's like, for example, painting Richard, he peeled on the one side because the sunlight hit it and warmed up the plastic. And I, I remember, if I just like a think about Richard, oh, Richard, oh, was the one that peeled. And it's like, it's really weird. You're talking about a painting, but at the same time, you're talking about it as a separate entity. It's like a little person. And it's really kind of bizarre, but like the more, the more I kept creating these paintings, the more they just ended up being named. For my residency, I set out that I was going to do this project where I collected statements um, from the autistic community online. Again, as I mentioned in the talk earlier, um, statements that they sort of hold dearly to themselves. And I took these statements anonymously. They don't know who they belong to. But these are all statements that they, they hold to themselves. And I integrated them all one by one um, into my monster paintings, essentially. And the reason I did this is I did this via print. I did this as a reverse print via acetate. And I did this as these are pasted onto you. These are not things you've come up with yourself. These are statements that have been told to you been said to you and then you wear them like a little badge and that's why all these statements are just integrated and built into these main things so they they literally they become part of the form 
they build into the shapes and some of them are written freehand and I really liked the juxtaposition between the two but you've got the printed ones which are very much sort of centered and pushed on and then other ones that people kind of gave me towards the end of the project and after having some conversations with those at 42nd Street and how they felt about this project and how they felt they they ended up being added in freehand so it's more of they're not necessarily statements that are always imprinted on them but statements that they still held in the same way but a lot of the time it's something they told themselves and I think kind of having those two ways of creating the pieces with the with the typography built in kind of made this project for me personally really interesting but at the same time I wanted it to be I wanted it to be a voice and, and a vessel for the sort of things that these people struggle with and I think a lot of the time especially when you go searching into these you can find some really unpleasant ones and I think when you find those really unpleasant ones it kind of hits you just how a lot of the time these statements are things that they've held onto for a long time and usually by people that have been very close to them and I think the the fact that these are now exhibited is exactly what I wanted this project to be and I, I came up with this over the summer and my original plan was once I'd moved into my new home in Manchester that I would essentially just get used to kind of living there and I thought hang on I have a chance to make this more impactful than just creating 10 paintings or, and sticking them on the internet for people to see. And the remaining pieces that are here are pieces I've created over the course of the last year and a half um, during this miscreation. And the tile pieces are my personal favourite because I basically moved away um, from my home in Birmingham um, to live here with my girlfriend in July and we moved in and we were messed around by our landlord and our landlord told us various different things and I had to learn how to cope with our house being a building site. Now as someone on the autistic spectrum I really like my downtime, I really like my personal space and our house was literally anyone could walk in, the door was open 24-7 practically, the builders would just wander in and out whenever they pleased. And what they left behind were these two tiles. And if I can get my hands on something, I'm going to see what ink does to it. Um, the board underneath it, I put there as an example, they usually work on a board like this. So the board on the table with the wood, because the wood reacts very differently to the ink. And then again, the, wood, the ink reacts very differently on tiles than it does perspex. And I kind of, I created the one on the right first, the pink one, and just fell in love with the medium and then started playing around with it in the, in the green as well. So they're now sibling paintings. But I think this is the start of me coming back to using ceramics in the future as well. I really like the, I, I think the more I've done this and the more I've worked to this, the more I've been more playful with it. I think when you start out and you, you go to uni and everything's very official and everyone's always kind of, oh, you have to understand exactly what it is you're doing. You have to know your, your practice in and out. I think the, the further away from my teachings at uni I've got, the more playful I've got with it. I mean, if you look into a majority of the paintings, you will find something different every time. There are little, little faces everywhere. Literally, this one has a face in the mouth, a little face there, a little face there, a little face there. They all sort of, there are lots of little silly parts to them that you don't see the first time. I think the more sort of like playful and the more sort of approachable I've made them, the more it's enabled people to kind of take a chance to listen to why, why I've created them in the first place. It makes the, the subject of mental health a little bit more approachable. You make something physical out of something uncomfortable and then suddenly it makes it easy for people to talk about it. Some of them are quite heart-like, organ-like. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, because I think as, as someone who had a lot of issues with anxiety mostly overall, I think I always associated anxiety, you feel it inside. 
as as a as a bizarre feeling in all the all sorts of strange places. Like there's been times where I've had anxiety, and you can feel it in the muscles in your leg, like the muscles in your leg will tense up. And I think that kind of I think like I kind of move to that sort of direction. I think sometimes with the more like organ, almost like fleshy. I think it's kind of that unnerving kind of. They appear fleshy, but they're sometimes that a little bit too colourful to be fleshy sort of thing. Like, I think it's creating something that, again, is something that is inside, and I feel that is inside rather than on the outside. And I think, again, it's something that I've played around with, and I think it's something that just kind of, even though it's not something in the forefront that I've done, it's something I've played with in the past, and it still sort of has its place in the more modern stuff that I create. I think, you know, I'll, I'll move away from a particular way of doing something and even now I'll find it. It's like, oh, I used to do that three years ago. I haven't used that technique before. I think that with the, with the shading and the, the building in to kind of create the more 3D elements, that's a much more recent technique than to the ones downstairs. You know, if you compare these ones to the ones downstairs, these ones look different because they are more sort of 3D. I've worked into these a lot longer with drawing pens um, than I have with the ones downstairs. In fact, I haven't created the shadows. So there's like more depth, there's more shape. I've played around more. I, I like working with bizarre shapes. I think like I, a lot of the time when you see a monster, they're usually very human-like. They're, you know, like, because that's what the brain conceives as and as like a physical being, like a person. It's like it's going to have arms, it's going to have legs, and sometimes they're just a bit weird with it, and it's like, oh, this one's got tentacles, sort of thing. But I think like the more you move away from that, the more sort of unsettling and uncomfortable it becomes. I think a lot of the time I just like sort of playing around with objects. I think that's why I liked using the term messy miscreation instead of it being sort of more serious. Because it is, it is sort of a playful way of being able to approach a situation or a subject that people don't necessarily want to be comfortable with. Um, I've got my heart pretty much set on fine art. I'd been turned away from BCU, so my local uni basically said that my work wasn't good enough. Um, so I went, I, end, I went to Coventry in the end. I'm really glad I did. But um, as I've said numerous times, I've come away from the fine art side of things and barely feel like I know anything. You know, I studied three years of fine art and all I learned is that they stand there, look at it as what it is you do, judge it accordingly to how they feel it looks and then that's that, you know. And illustration teaches you so much more in terms of marketing yourself, in terms of how you present yourself, in terms of what it is your work stands for, and most of all, telling stories. So from someone who a majority of the time gets bored with things because stories don't always interest me, I think learning illustration, the ability to kind of tell stories through the medium of like still image, I think that is what has kind of created how I've been able to tell stories with my work. It was illustration training, it wasn't anything to do with fine art. And I think if I hadn't have done a course that had more illustration than it did fine art, I think I don't, I wouldn't be doing what it is I did today. Like the fine art tutors hated my work, which is without a doubt. The illustration tutors loved what it was I was doing, especially the tutor who was in charge of the course. But in terms of the actual fine art tutors, they didn't think what I did was art. It's too ornate, I think was the one term that was used. So these are kind of like tumours within yourself? Essentially. It basically is a, a visual of that kind of festering and that ability to, to hold on to something. The yeah, manifestation of yeah. the comments. So like during the talk I was saying about how a lot of the community was displaying that they'd, they'd say something about themselves and you would read it and you'd go, you've not said that to yourself, someone in the past has said that and you've, oh, decided, you've, you've decided that that's how you are because someone has told you that way. And I wanted this to be kind of a way of kind of making that vocal that it, it's not going down the traditional route of an anti-bullying campaign, but more of that these, these things that you can say to people in the spectrum will be held there for a long time. So do you think that like, you'll develop this work into then replacing what you see here with like, positive affirmations and things that then actually break down 
these things that have manifested that from... I'd actually really things. like to return to this project next year and do it that way, actually. Yeah. I think I was thinking about that yesterday, like the idea of returning to this project and reapproaching, you know, because the, the community that I have online and the people that were giving their statements were, you know, like people who have followed me now for about three years on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I think I've got about just under 600, no, just over 600 followers now on Twitter. So like a lot of them are through sort of like the people who had originally followed my dad. Yeah. And then others have kind of been picked up along the way from all the exhibitions I've done. So like returning in a year's time, um, I think would be perfect. Because mm -hmm. I think it, a lot of people are kind of, I had had like a conversation with a few people that gave statements, even though it was anonymous. They just wanted to have a, you know, a quick chat. I didn't know which ones they submitted that were their statements, mm -hmm. but they they had discussed that as life went on, they were able to kind of disconnect from their statements more, mm -hmm. and they're able to kind of change and perceive how it was they've changed. So I think it would be great to revisit them in that sense, and especially since, you know, I've I've kind of proven to myself that I can create. Them, sort of like the monsters that were a lot friendlier. So I think like originally they were all very sort of aggressive and I think as time's gone on they've just sort of moulded into something different. Mm. I think it's because I think a lot of the time it's just, it's like you have sort of more good days now than I have bad days. Mm. And I think it, 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 you know, it shows in what I'm doing. I've had several people question what are you going to do when your mental health gets better? And it's like, I'll just, I'll paint something different. <laughs> you know, like, you see, you see, I've got, like, paintings downstairs of Squish. He's still, same medium, same everything, but he's a lot happier. Mm -hmm. And Squish was painted in a time where um, I finally was able to stop having to call the job centre every week and give numbers on my business. And essentially, I, I originally funded my business through the Princess Trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think 90% of it was my money, though. So like a majority of the way through, but I had to call the job center every month and tell them how much I earned. And a majority of the time they'd tell me, but you, you know, your business is failing sort of thing. And it used to like literally leading up to that day every day, like my parents would just tell because my mental state would go downhill. You know, I had to call them and tell them how much I'd earned. And Squish was painted at the time that that came to a close. And I didn't have to do that anymore. You know, I wasn't getting any more money to support my business, but that, that wasn't something that mattered to me anymore. You know, I'd managed to get things off the ground. I'd managed to be able to, to get somewhere with it. And uh, I think, you know, Facebook tells you memories now. So it like tells you, oh, a year ago today sort of thing. It literally told me a year ago um, on Monday that I first started advertising my first exhibition through my name, um, Messy Miss Creation. And I found that bizarre. Because it was like they were so close together in terms of like one exhibition the year before. And since then, I've had seven exhibitions now. This is the seventh. Okay. And the fact that I've had, you know, the opportunities along the way and just be able to just kind of push through has kind of proven to myself that it is possible. I think, you know, like a lot of the time you're kind of told, you know, I've, I've had my fair share along the way. I've been told I can't do it. And that's not to say that I haven't had people supporting me along the way either. Mm -hmm. You know, like at the at the end of all this and um, a set amount of the money made from this, I'm going to get some prints made of the two ceramic pieces. And there's a huge list of people who have helped me um, along the way over mm -hmm. this past year. I've had friends drive me out to Wolverhampton from Birmingham in the car with all my art stuff in the back. I've had people who have, you know, the people really, really gone out of their way to help me do what it is I do. And my plan is, once this comes to a close, I'm gonna get some prints made and they're gonna get sent some prints. Mm -hmm. You know, they're gonna be numbered, they're gonna be signed, and it's gonna be a thank you to everybody who's given me, you know, this isn't, this isn't just me that's done this, to be able to get to this position. It's literally, you know, tens if not, you know, significantly more people who have just believed in, in what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So I think it just, it makes sense to me to be, I always feel that I need to sort of give something back because I think a lot of the time I, I go out of my way to sort of help people whenever I can and I think sometimes that reflects on the support you get back.
Mm. You know, like if you, with with this residency, I've put my all in. I've put in as much time as I possibly can and, and tried my best. And, and Julie has helped support me the entire way. You know, you you put in you put in hard work. You get you get back. I think a lot of people don't necessarily sort of follow that practice. 